Well, first off, I suppose, the campaign group and the farm that started with Willie Macombo, Brandon's <coughs> father, sent a small campaign, as much material from the case as he could, because he didn't believe that his son or John Paul were guilty of what they said, they were guilty of, and that they didn't belong in jail. And he started posting those information packs out to people. So at that time I was in jail along with John Paul and Brandon, and we sent information out that they had to try and help the campaign and get it off the ground. What we also done was, with the little time we had, getting out the phone as we were in protest at the time, we phoned anybody we knew and asked to fall in behind the family here and see can you give them a hand because these were just two ordinary people, you know, trying to do what they could. Weren't activists and had found themselves in this situation, similar to what Jerry had said earlier in the tape about how his mother must have felt when she first sat down to start writing letters. And that's where Jerry got that connection when he first met uh, Willie and Aileen and Sean. <coughs> but we set out from the start at before the campaign group existed, and with both men firmly convicted and held McGilbert, a Google search of Brent McConnell and John Paul Wotton, or <coughs> Stephen Carroll would have thrown up these images of Brent and John Paul being put into PSNA vehicles, handcuffed images from helicopters with people in forensic suits, and uh, cop killers, murderers. <coughs> this was the general thing. This was how the public narrative of the case of Brendan McConville and John Paul Wooden was perceived by the public. We set out to change that and we were very lucky early on that Jerry Conlon became involved in the case because he became involved in the case and he says, I'm going to stand up here and speak my mind. And he was a small island and a very fast running stream. And the Irish News, a special thanks has to go out to Conley Young who's here tonight and has covered a lot of the Craig Alvin 2 work in the Irish News. Connell's story was front page and there was an audible shock almost from the establishment that uh, someone like Jerry Connell had come on board with the campaign and that a paper with a reputation like the Irish News had made it front page news. We went from there very rapidly to lobbying all politicians. Anybody, anyone I could get an email address for was lobbied. Now, everyone in Stormont, everyone at Westminster, Everyone in Lancaster House all received that, that email. Now, very few came back. There was some interaction with the SDLP, some interaction with, Sh with Sinn Féin, and very proactive uh, relationship built up with the Iraqis group, with uh, Claire Daly and Ian O'Keefe. So, that was two, twofold. Our, our campaign was twofold. First, to change the public perception. Through, uh, through PR, and one of our biggest weapons for that became social media, Facebook, Twitter, <coughs> and the website, very quickly the website was created and as much information as possible about the campaign could be got on that. Now we had a set time frame, we knew at some stage within the next year that an appeal was going to be heard, and we felt that if we could change public opinion and bring public pressure to bear and public scrutiny of the facts, because the case was so ridiculous on paper, this case is ridiculous, absolutely rotten to the core. What lies at the centre of this case isn't just the need for this, the state to scapegoat two Irish Republicans for the killing of a British police officer. What you probably have, and what my personal opinion of the case is, is that the British state instigated an incident that led to the death of a British police officer. And now, at all costs, MA5 and the PSNA are battling down the hatches. A political dictate, I believe, was handed down to the judges to come to the decision because that decision is completely at odds with what happened in the appeal court. The campaign now, following that obvious setback, has to intensify. We've been very small, we've had very little funding. Any money or fund we've raised has been our, out of our own pockets. The money doesn't exist at the moment to reprint updated leaflets. That's how dire the situation is with us. It's a very, very small family and activist based group. And off the back of that, we have encouraged acts of solidarity from other groupings, from other peoples, from anyone who wanted to go out, hold a protest, hold up a placard, do anything in relation to the Craig Alvin 2. Because that was a way for us to spread the word about the Craig Alvin 2. And there's no 
You know, there's no uh, standards complex here. There's no centralized control and command structure. If sp spontaneous protests and organized things like that pop up, we're more than happy to back it and publicize it. <coughs> and we continue to, to do that. And it lets groups who release statements, groups such as Erega, groups such as the societies, groups such as the 32 County Sovereignty Movement and others, come on board, read the facts, come to their own analysis, put out a statement. We support those statements because they get out to a broader, it gets to a broader pool. People that we couldn't reach if we acted within the remit that we have or in, inside the confines that we have. So the appeal to feet is nothing new. Going from a legal perspective, the John Give is not new. The Guilford Four lost their appeal, the Birmingham Six lost their appeal, and more recently Barry George, who was convicted for more than Jill Lando, lost two appeals. So there's a real reluctance on behalf of the state to acknowledge that they have done wrong. And the state here obviously is a lot more dark and twisted after 30 years of conflict. To intensify the campaign, we want to supplement the lobbying of politicians and the PR campaign along with taking to the streets. And that would involve tying in with other groupings to do what Jerry has done. And we have a banner here made behind us that we're going to proudly display at the anti internment rally on Sunday. We hope that everybody would turn out for that rally. It's purely on the issue of human rights. But what we have now coming up foremost as our, as our next step, we had to think with very limited resources how we reach out to people, how we break, if you like, the, the hold that there is in the media. And social media has shown us, because it's our, one of our biggest stance, almost 90% of the people we've reached with our campaign has been reached in social media. The advert for this event tonight was seen by almost 30,000 people. On social, on social media, so it gives you an idea of the reach that your message can get. So we looked at social media campaigns recently that had been very successful, and we centered on the idea of a song, a song about the lads. I think it was Angela's idea. She, she said, you know, hey, has anybody thought of a song? And we started thinking, we said, well, who could you get to do a song? And someone proposed uh, Paul McAdam. Paul's here tonight. So I contacted Paul, and Paul more than willingly come on board, he asked questions about the lads, he read up on them and he has, he has written a song that he's going to play in a few moments. But what we want to do with that song, we thought, how can we use this song to reach as many people as possible? You can make a YouTube video and hope that somehow it went viral and that you would get the hits. And we looked at campaigns held by groups such as the Green Brigade, Celtic supporters against criminalisation, and they successfully embarrassed the British establishment by putting the Irish Brigade song The Rule of Honour into the UK charts. And I think it charted at 18 or 19. And that was through a concerted social media campaign to buy the song from iTunes, to buy the song from uh, Google Play Store and other electronic outlets. So Paul has written a song, he's in the process of recording a version of that song. The Justice for Crow Album 2 group is going to release that song digitally through iTunes through Google Play, and we need everyone here to download it. We need their family members to download it. We need you to text, email, get in touch with your friends on social media, tell them to download it. If we can get enough sales of the song, that song will go into the UK Top 40. That means that every radio station that plays the charts in England will play the song about Brendan McCampbell and John Paul Watt. Now, you don't need hundreds of thousands to get a song into the charts anymore. The Green Brigade got the Rule of Honour song, the number 18, with 11,000 sales. It's estimated that over the 4,000 sale mark, you can get a song in the UK at half 40, and on every radio station in the UK. You can't buy that publicity. You can't buy the political counter-reaction that that creates. It puts this case and miscarriages of justice firmly on the political agenda. It puts it on the public mindset and on the public agenda. So those are the sort of fresh blue sky thinking that the group is involved in confirming this campaign where it doesn't tie up a lot of resources but it is activist based it takes somebody to say I'm disgusted by this I'm going to spend 99p on that song and that person in is part of that campaign he's a figure in that number in that chart and helps to put that in the public domain 
I'm going to wrap up now and uh, pass you back down to me.